And uh, <laughs> the guy at the counter walks up and he goes, what happened to your face? <laughs> and I looked at him and I, I thought, should I be gentle? And I'm like, no. I go, I have cancer. This is what treatments do to your face. He's like, oh, dude, is that like from the sun? <laughs> I wanted to have had to go, no, I was fine. Ate at McDonald's, woke up, cancer. <laughs> yeah, anyway. So, okay. We are in our new series called Meet the Cast. It's our Christmas series to take us up until our Christmas Eve service. Uh, And in this series, we're going to look at several important people uh, surrounding the birth of Christ. Now, uh, we're going to be covering Mary, who's the mother of Jesus, and Zacharias, which we covered last week. Uh, We're going to be covering Joseph today, and then the wise men, and then Simeon and Jesus. Uh, And last week, like I said, we covered Mary uh, and Zacharias, and there was a lot there. Today, we're going to look at Joseph, uh, who was Mary's husband. And now, in my personal opinion, this is one of the most underappreciated, important people in the Bible. Very underappreciated. And so the more you look into him, the more you realize that he was just so courageous uh, and so compassionate together. So that's what I titled this message, Courage and Compassion, because a man, I mean, only a man with an incredible amount of both could deal with what he had to deal with. It was, a, it was tough. So we're going to jump right in. Um, today will be a shorter one, so enjoy it, because next week won't be. Um, so we don't know that yet. But um, so I'm going to give you a little bit of his background. Joseph was an Israelite, which I think was a given, uh, and he's from the line of Judah, son of Jacob. Uh, it is, uh, his name in Hebrew is Yosef, is Yosef, and it means he will add, is what it means, he will add. Now, the book of Luke tells us that his father's name was Heli, uh, and as we know, he eventually married Uh, Mary, uh, the mother of Jesus, and he had five sons, uh, Jesus, James, uh, Joseph, Judas, Simon, and two daughters, uh, Salomon and Mary. So they had seven kids all together. We don't know a lot about when he died, uh, but we know that pretty much past uh, the dedication of Jesus at the temple, you just don't read a lot about him. Now, obviously, he had to live long enough to have, you know, six more kids, uh, and I'm assuming that was at least 14 years, or, or she is a blessed woman to live through that. <laughs> but So we assume probably, you know, by what, 14, 20 more years. But um, now he had some pretty notable relatives, okay, uh, in his line. Enoch, how many people know who Enoch is? Okay, Enoch was uh, a, a man in the Bible, a prophet who never died. He was just taken up into heaven. Um, Noah, you probably never heard of that guy. Noah, he built a boat and stuff. No, everybody knows who Noah is, right? Okay, Noah, um, Abraham, who was a father of faith, uh, Isaac, Jacob, Judah, uh, King David, Boaz, Ruth. There's a lot of important people in his lineage. Like I said, Jacob, who became the father of the 12 tribes of Israel. Uh, But Joseph was a carpenter by trait, and Matthew tells us that he was a righteous man. And Matthew 1.19 says, And Joseph, her husband, being a righteous man and not wanting to disgrace her, uh, planned to send her away secretly. So, uh, he was considered a righteous man by his peers, uh, but what he accomplished in his life, I mean, just rivals any of those people in his lineage, because what he had to deal with was amazing. So let's jump right in. Okay, now, Matthew 118 says, this is, uh, this is how Jesus the Messiah was born. His mother Mary was engaged to be married to Joseph, but before the marriage took place, while she was still a virgin, she became pregnant through the power of the Holy Spirit. Joseph, whom was engaged... Uh, to whom she was engaged, was a righteous man and did not want to disgrace her, so he decided to break the engagement quietly. Now again, it was one of the greatest untold stories of faith in the Bible is Joseph's life. Because I want you to step into his shoes for just a minute. And every time I study him, I, I try to put myself in his shoes, right? Uh, at that time and in that culture, in that culture um, marriages were prearranged. And they had a great level of success in the prearranged marriage. I'm not saying we bring that back. But they used to have to be engaged for at least a year, which I think we should bring that back. What do you think? Make sure they have to be engaged for a year. Because I'm telling you what, if they were engaged for at least a year, I think about half of the marriages wouldn't happen. I'm just saying. But they wanted to make sure that they didn't, you know, want to kill each other, I guess. So they had to be at least a year. Uh, During that time, engaged couples were not allowed to be intimate. They were not allowed to be intimate at all. Engagement was uh, way more serious in their culture than it is in our culture. I mean, the engaged couple was actually considered husband and wife. You could refer to your fiancé as your wife and vice versa, the husband. And so if you were to have an affair on your betrothed, 
it was the same as committing adultery in the eyes of the law. It was adultery, right? And knowing that, imagine how Joseph felt when Mary came to him and said, I'm pregnant. Okay, imagine how he felt when she came to him and told him that. Now, most men in that culture, the reason it pointed out he didn't want to disgrace her, most men in that culture would have gotten rid of her because it was an insult to them as well as to her. And it would have hurt their pride. And I know nowadays guys don't have pride anymore. Okay, that's a lie. But no, they, uh, most people would have just gotten rid of her. But, you know, he didn't. He was different, which tells me that he really did love her. And if he would have just put her away and put, done it publicly, it not only would have ruined her reputation, it could have endangered her very life. I mean, her very life. But Joseph was a righteous man, uh, and he wanted to divorce her quietly. And what's weird is to end an engagement back then, you had to have a divorce. That's how serious an engagement was. It didn't end without a divorce. Now, I think all this tells us he obviously loved her because he really did care about her well-being. But if you think about it, he really displayed our first New Testament look at just unbelievable grace. Think about that. This is the man who would raise the Son of God, the King of grace, and he shows us a glimpse of the grace of his stepson, if you will, before he's even born. It's kind of neat. Now, God knew it would take a very special man to deal with a situation like that. Now, you have to realize that just as Mary was chosen, so was Joseph. He was chosen. I'll bet you there's not 1% of the population at that time could have even considered doing what he did. Probably not even 1%, right? So God sends this angel uh, to Joseph to ease his concerns about Mary. So Matthew 1.20 says, As he considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream. Joseph, son of David, the angel said, Do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child within her was conceived by the Holy Spirit, and she will have a son, and you will call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. So now, since this angel brought a message and it wasn't about war, which one do you think it was? You can say that with confidence. Gabriel, Gabriel right? The eight of you that answered that. Thank you. It was Gabriel. When, if it would have been Michael, it would have been war. And so when Gabriel came to him, he said, listen, it's okay to marry her. And it not only changed his mind, it changed his life. Because Gabriel told Joseph that the child in Mary's womb was from God. Now, I'm going to be honest with you, and I sat and thought about this for quite a while. Even though an angel came to him, even though an angel came to him, this still had to be really hard to believe. I mean, there, was, there had never been an immaculate conception before. It's not like they're like, oh yeah, Frida, my neighbor had immaculate conception. No, I mean, it had never happened. This was something totally new. Okay, so you know how we rationalize things? You know how we try to rationalize things? How many people in here are over-rationalizers? Oh my gosh, some of you are liars. Raise your hand. Thank you. But can you imagine the next day him waking up going, did I really have that dream? Or do I just love her and want to marry her? Because it, I still have to be sold on the fact that she's pregnant and it wasn't me. I mean, this still had to be a very, very difficult thing for him to deal with. So it's still a huge step of faith, I mean, to even believe that what this angel was telling him. But one thing that's going to become apparent about Joseph is he was an amazing man of faith, just an amazing man of faith. Now, the angel said, don't be afraid to take Mary as your wife. And when you read that, it's kind of strange. You're thinking, why would he be afraid? He didn't do anything wrong. He didn't do anything wrong. Why would he be afraid? And the thing is, he would have been afraid because marrying her would have been very complicated. You know how in our time... Nothing stays a secret. You guys know, I mean, we live in a small town, right? You can do something on Monday, and on Wednesday, everybody knows, right? Now, imagine someone comes up pregnant and is, a, you know, claiming that it's God's baby. How, how long do you think it took to get that around the village, right? It would have been very, very complicated. Now, think of his choices. If he had refused to marry her, he would have basically been saying she's an adulteress. And she would have been treated as an adulteress, which could have cost her her life. It was a death penalty offense in some instances back then. And on the other hand, if he married her, you know what people would have thought? He was thinking, if I, if I marry her, everybody's going to say, hmm, they were fooling around. Because we know it wasn't God that put the baby there, 
they would have immediately thought that they'd been fooling around. And, and uh, back then, back then it was, that was looked at, frowned upon big time. Can you imagine him trying to sell that to the people at the gate and to the, the Jewish leaders? I'm going to marry her. I know she's pregnant, but it's not my baby. It's God's baby. Can you imagine? He, I mean, how would you even get the nerve to tell the Sanhedrin council that I'm marrying a pregnant woman, it's not my baby, it's God's? You know what I mean? That was a tough, tough choice that he had to make. Back then, sex before marriage was a no-no. I mean, they weren't as lax about it as we are today. We should still be like they were, but that's just the way it was. Unlike the world we live in now, morality was actually very important at that time, very important at that time. Imagine what people would have said about them, and imagine how people would have treated them, right? And I'd, I'd say other than family, most people, remember, most people didn't believe in Jesus from the Jewish nation. So most people probably died thinking this was a scam. Most of the family and friends that he knew probably died believing this was a scam and that he lied because they never accepted Jesus uh, as their Savior. Now, knowing that, his willingness to marry her is, once again, a lot of evidence of how much he loved her. Now, next, he said... You are to name him Jesus, for he will save his people. Now, there's a lot of things that make it nerve-wracking when you know you're going to be a first-time father. How many many people here remember being a first-time dad? Raise your hands. Was I the only one that was a nervous wreck? When when my daughter had, or when my daughter, that's a different story. When When my wife had my first daughter, when I came out to tell everybody what it was, you know, I was crying so uncontrollably, nobody understood a word I said. And I was a nervous wreck. And I, I was thinking to myself, they're so, what if I drop them? I mean, you know, there's so much, they require so much care. You're just, you're just afraid. And you know, the women don't have to do much. We have to do everything. So <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. No, but, um, you know, it, it's nerve wracking. Now, you talk, that's a lot of pressure on a young father. Imagine now. Being a young father, and God sends an angel and says, oh yeah, you're going to raise the Savior of the world. Imagine that. Talk about worrying about dropping him. I mean, think about this. This is the Savior of the world that he was going to have to raise. That would be tough. I always wondered how difficult it would be to raise the Son of God. Anybody ever think about that? Would you even check his report card? I mean, he's Jesus. I don't think he's going to flunk anything, right? He probably never got in trouble. And if he did, how do you discipline the one who formed you from dirt and breathed life into your nostrils? You know, how do you discipline someone that could wave their hand and you would be out of existence? It had to be tough raising the Son of God. Also, imagine being one of the siblings of Jesus. How many people have ever heard of sibling rivalry? How many people had to live with sibling rivalry? Raise your hand. I was the seventh of seven. Sounds like a prophecy, doesn't it? And lo, he was the seventh of seven. And people think, oh, that's the, that's the baby. They get everything. Uh-uh. The sixth one was my sister, Kara. She got everything because she could play dad like a fiddle. <laughs> Sorry, dad. Got to face up to it. She could play him like a fiddle, right? And it was so funny because I would always get compared. They'd say, why don't you get straight A's like Mary? I'm like, well, good baby. You know, well, Scott was class president. Ooh, good for Scott. I mean, all the time. You know, it could, probably didn't hurt, you know, didn't help me that I had hair down to here. You know, me walking and going, what's wrong with my grade? You know. How many people here had a mullet? I wasn't the only one. Raise your hands. Own it. How many people had a mullet? Don't make me call. There you go, Lonnie. Don't you dare. How many people had a mullet that had curly hair in the back? What is that? There it is. No way, Craig. You got to get me that picture. You know, but I was, so yeah, I mean, I took on the 80s persona, but I was always compared to one of my siblings. And I'll never forget one time I heard my parents talking about they only wanted to have five kids. I'm the seventh of seven. Well, I remember one day dad said, yeah, we, we didn't plan on you. And yeah, that's why my self-esteem is so great today. And my sister came in the room, being the compassionate sister she is, and she, goes, she walks in, she goes, you were an accident, you were, she's going on and on, and dad walks in, he said, hey, Kara, what? So are you. <laughs> and I'm sitting over here going, yes, two mistakes. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's why our confidence is really high. 
But imagine if, I mean, I had a rough time with sibling rivalry, and none of them were God. Now imagine, you know, say, why can't you be like Jesus? Because I'm not God. That's why. Imagine having that rivalry, okay? So considering all of these consequences, why would Joseph even consider marrying her? Why would he even consider it? It would have been easier all the way around if he just walked away, or at least it would have appeared to be that way. But that's not the man Joseph was. That's not who he was. Again, that's also why I believe that he's one of the most underappreciated people in the Bible. Most people would have walked away. He really had strong faith. Now, Joseph knew that the Jews had been anxiously awaiting their Savior for centuries. He knew that. This played into his decision. So when Joseph heard that the child of his fiance was going to be their long-awaited Messiah, he agreed. Because you have to remember, he was also a faithful Jew who had also been looking forward to their coming Messiah. So can you imagine any faithful Jew, any faithful Jew would love for this to happen, would love to be a part of the, of the Messiah's ministry in any, any fashion. But sometimes I wonder if he just stopped and looked around and said, look what a mess we've made of Judaism. We're corrupt. We're self-righteous. We're judgmental. You know, we have made a mess of everything God intended for this uh, this relationship to be. So a part of me thinks he's saying, if it's even a chance that it's true and it can fix this mess, I'm going to do it. How many people feel that way about our country, our, where we live, this world today? Do you ever feel like, what a mess? Anybody ever feel that way? How many people watch the news? Well, don't. Every time I watch the news, I have to go get antidepressants because I'm just saying... I look around, and I want you guys to be honest about something. How many of you have ever looked at everything that's going on and said, I just wish Jesus would come back today? Raise your hand if you said that. You know, it seems selfish, but we all want him to come and fix our problems, right? I've said it many, many times. Well, not much difference here. I believe that he thought, you know what, it's time to get all this fixed. And so that's probably why he was so quick to agree to all that. But despite all that, I mean... He knew their lives were going to be difficult. Having a baby always makes life difficult. Always makes life difficult. That hasn't changed. It changes everyone's life forever. Remember when you first got married and you didn't have kids? A lot of you go, no. But remember how you would like sleep till 10 o'clock? Anybody remember that? And get up and run to McDonald's and get a burrito and come home and eat it and, you know, and say, hey, you feel like, let's go, let's go to Florida. Okay. Remember those days? Or said, hey, you know, want to go out tonight? Yeah, let's call our friends and let's all play cards. Remember those days? Yeah, when you have a baby, it's over. That does, now, it doesn't happen anymore. All right? It just it doesn't. The, the long, peaceful nights of sleep, over. Done. The bonus is if your wife breastfeeds. Because then at night you can just go, really, I mean, what can I do? <laughs> so you need to get up and go get her. You know what I mean? <laughs> Yeah, Jenny went for that for a while. Then she goes, well, you know what? Here's what you can do. You can get your butt up and go get her and bring her to me. <laughs> and being the bold head of my household, I'm like, okay. <laughs> and I went and did it, right? Uh, remember how your house used to smell like potpourri? Then you have babies and it smells like diapers. <laughs> yeah, everything, everything changes. Now, don't take me wrong. It's still worth it. Children, the Bible says that they are, they are a blessing and they are. They are a blessing most of the time. They are a blessing. But Joseph and Mary, think of their situation. This baby was not only going to change their lives, he was going to change the world forever, forever. So it's hard to wrap my brain around it. Now let's move on because Joseph stepped out on faith and just listened to this angel and took Mary as his wife. Uh, starting Matthew 1, he says, All of this occurred to fulfill the Lord's message through the prophet. Look, the virgin will conceive a child, she will give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. When Joseph woke up, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded and took Mary as his wife. But he did not have sexual relations with her until her son was born, and Joseph named him Jesus. Now, at the end of the day, I mean, Joseph knew seeing the will of God accomplished outweighed any struggles, any fears he might have. So this, again, shows his great faith. Now, one point I want to make is God doesn't make mistakes. One thing I think we forget about God is that he not only sees who we are, 
He sees who we're going to be. He sees who we can be, right? See, most people saw Joseph and they saw this honest, hardworking, skilled carpenter who tried to follow the law the best he could. But God saw Joseph as a man who had faith and courage and integrity and was willing to see his will through despite the personal risks. That's how God saw him. No one else saw him that way at the time, but that's how God saw him. Now, as human beings, one thing we love to do is to stereotypically put limitations on people based on perception. Let me explain. We like pedigrees. We like pedigrees. We like paperwork. But we don't think a lot about possibilities in people. We want people to be verified, like on Twitter. We want there to be a blue X or a blue check mark by their name, verified before we'll have anything to do with them, right? I mean, we underestimate people. We always have underestimated people. But we underestimate people for the dumbest reasons, like for edu- we'll underestimate people who we don't feel are educated enough or, or for their gender or their age or race or family history. How many people have ever been victim of saying, well, I know their family history? Has that ever happened to anybody? Yeah, it did me. You know, and I'm saying it's, it's weird that we still are, as, as enlightened as we feel like we are, we still are that judgmental. How many times have you heard somebody say, well, I know, but you know what family that guy comes from? You ever heard that? Unbelievable that still goes on today, but it does still go on today. I've literally heard people say that about me. There was a, a person who said their mother, this is a 30-year-old. First of all, the first thing I wanted to say was, when are you going to cut the umbilical cord, dude? But he was 30-some years old, and he said, I can't go to your church. And I said, why? He said, because uh, my mom says she remembers you from high school. <laughs> I'm like going, I had a mullet, too. You know, what do you want me to say here? You know? So what? I got so used to being judged. I remember we were raised in a church that was a wee bit judgmental. And so I thought, you know what I'm going to do? They stared at me every time I walked through the door anyway. So I thought, I'm going to give them something to stare at. So I would go to church with my long, flowing locks. And I'd make sure I had an ACDC or Iron Maiden shirt on. And fingerless gloves. Come on now, who had them? <laughs> Come on now, Ray, who had them? Thank you. <laughs> One person. Lonnie. <laughs> and the trench coat. How many people had the trench coat? You guys remember this? Blast from the past? So everybody's wearing their clothes, their good stuff, and in comes Chris. Flowing trench coat. ACDC t-shirt flowing red hair, headband. I'm like, y'all want to stare? Check that. <laughs> you know, because that's just who we are. We, we like to underestimate people. And I just got to a point where I said, I don't care. But that's what, the way we are. We are also guilty of underestimating how powerfully God can use those people. You know, it's amazing that we still don't get this. In Christianity today, we still judge people way too much. When people say, I don't want to go to church because Christians are judgmental, I look at them and say, you are right. Well, we're trying to change that. You know what I mean? Because when they say, we don't want to go to church because people are self-righteous, I say, you are right, but we are trying to change that. And then the battle cry of the unbeliever, I don't want to go to church because people are hypocrites. And I say, better go to church with them than hell with them. I'm just saying, you know, but this is the way people think. And what we have forgotten when we start getting judgmental, when we start getting exclusive, what we have forgotten is God didn't change the world with professors. God didn't change the world with philosophers, and there were a lot of them around at that time. God didn't change the world with politicians. I don't even know if that's possible to change the world with politicians. Politicians, I kind of look at politics as a big outhouse, you know? And the difference between the different parties is the color of your outhouse, because they're all a swamp. But anyway, God didn't use any of those people to change the world. Who did he use? Twelve ordinary men changed the world. Twelve ordinary men. The only two that even had any kind of any semblance of real education, uh, Luke was trained in, med- in the medical field. If you look back now, it was more like an army medic from what most historians tell you. I mean, he wasn't performing, you know, triple bypass or anything. And the apostle Paul, when he became the twelfth apostle after Matthias, he literally, literally, or after Judas rather, he, he was very educated. He was the only one that was, right? He also changed the world with women, I get so tired of people underestimating women. I've coached girls for over 25 years. And I'm telling you right now, they shouldn't be taken for granted. Ruth was in the lineage of Christ. One of the most powerful biblical figures to walk the earth was a woman, and her name was Ruth. And if you don't know that story, get acquainted with it. Mary, Elizabeth, 
I mean, the line is full of women who changed the world. But what you'll notice is they were ordinary women. They were ordinary women. So before we start judging people about their family or their heritage or their race or gender or ethnicity or whatever it may be, take a step back and realize if you were back in Jesus' time, you might be judging the same kind of person that God used to change the world. And who's to say he can't do it now? Because he still can. And he still uses ordinary people to change the world. Like Joseph, God is going to give us all opportunities. Everybody. But sometimes I think we are so afraid of failing that we don't see them. Listen, God never created one person without a purpose. We were all created on purpose for a purpose. All of us were. It's just some people realize it and some don't. Listen, if you're a believer, I promise you God has a ministry for you. He has a ministry for you if you're willing to accept it. But I think believers nowadays would love to sit back and say, no, somebody else will do it. I don't want it to be me. You know what I mean? Whenever we're looking for volunteers, you find out how true that is. You know what I mean? I mean, we, we ask for nursery volunteers. Everybody's going, wait, got a trick here. I didn't hear that. What was that as they're going out the door? You know, I'm just saying, trust me on this. A lot of times we say, well, somebody's got to do it. I just don't think it's me. What do I have to offer? Well, he loved you enough to die for you. He created you, and he doesn't make mistakes. So he has a purpose for you. The question is, do you want to see that purpose realized in your life? Because the only person that can rob you of that purpose is you. You're the only person that can rob you of your purpose. And I love, can you imagine, there are over 7,000 people in this town who do not have a church. Can you imagine if everyone in here got serious about their faith and stepped up and said, God, show me how you want to use me? Imagine how many, we wouldn't, that building we're building, we'd have to build it four times that size and then have another campaign a year later because people would be pouring in if there were more people like Joseph looking for their purpose, right? There are so many people that need to hear the gospel this day. Look what Jesus said in Matthew 9, 35. He said, Jesus was going through all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every kind of disease and every kind of sickness. Uh, seeing the people, he felt compassion for them because they were distressed and dispirited like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is what? Plentiful, but the workers are few. That hasn't changed. Verse 38, therefore beseech the Lord of the harvest to send workers into the harvest. Jesus basically said here, the opportunity is great and nobody's accepting it. He's saying, he didn't say pray that God will send us a, somebody with a doctorate of theology or a great speaker, philosopher. He said, send us workers. People are saying, here I am, use me. One of my favorite phrases in the whole Bible is when someone says, here I am, use me. If we had that mentality, can you imagine how many lives we'd change? Aren't you glad Joseph had that mentality? Every life we could change. God still uses ordinary men and women to reach it. And you know, are you one of them? Absolutely you are. There are people you have influence over that I will never be able to influence. The question is, do you want to use it? You know, I said earlier that everyone has a gift. Joseph's gift, faith, courage, compassion. That was his gift, but everyone has one. This is one of my favorite passages in the Bible, 1 Peter 4.10. It says, as each one has received a special gift, employ it. What does it say? Employ it. Now, he didn't say if each person has a spiritual gift. He says as, meaning everybody has one. As each one has received a spiritual gift, employ it uh, in serving one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. Whoever speaks is to do so as one who is speaking the utterances of God. Whoever serves is to do so as one serving by the strength which God supplies, so that in all things God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom belongs the glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Listen, one of my prayers, you know, we've been going through a lot of stuff about the new building, and we've been going through a lot of stuff making plans, but I'm telling you right now, my biggest prayer, God will handle the details, is 
Don't just give us a bigger building. Give us people to fill that building who want to fill it more. We want people who not only show up, but put up, are willing to step out and serve God. That's what I want more than anything. And every time I read this, I think to myself, why aren't we taking advantage of that opportunity? If there's one thing we can learn from the life of Joseph is it's always the unexpected people that do the amazing things. It's the ordinary people that do the extraordinary things. It's the people who are willing to say, don't see me, see God, who reveals God to more people. We just need to make sure we get our minds right so we can get there. Okay, I'm going to close there because we are going to pick up next week with the wise men. Enjoy this short one, ladies and gentlemen. But remember, you have connection cards in front of you. They talked about earlier. Make sure you fill those out. But if you would, please bow your heads. We always like to give an invitation. If there's someone here who's not sure where they stand with God or just needs prayer, I don't need to know what it is. But I genuinely take time out to pray for those faces. Bless those people. Just make eye contact with me or slip your hand up. Bless those people. Bless those people. And I do pray for you. Bless those people. Listen, if you're watching or listening online, God knows your heart. I'll be praying for you. But believers, every time, I, every time I do a message about someone with great faith stepping out who wasn't expected to do anything but change the world, I think about what we could do if we got serious. I think about what we could do if we loved more than we excluded and embraced more than we judged. Imagine what we could do in this world if we start trying to win people with love. It would change everything. Let's pray. God, I thank you so much for all that you do. I thank you for your mercy and your kindness and especially your grace. I know there's nothing we have to offer, God. I know none of us deserve it. There's nothing any of us could have ever done to deserve heaven. But you loved your creation so much that you couldn't stand being apart from us. So you sent your son to die on a cross innocently to pay for all of our sin so that all we had to do was believe in what he did and you'd give us eternal life. And your word promises that. God, if there's someone here who hasn't done that or listening who hasn't done that, whatever's holding them back, remove it. Let them see clearly for just a moment what kind of love it took to go to that cross, what kind of compassion it took to come down and give your life for people who would turn their backs on you and let them believe. And if they make that decision, I pray they contact us. We want to walk with them in their journey. For those of us who are believers, God, take us back to the fire we once had. Let us remember all the people who invested in us and showed us the love of Christ to bring us into this relationship. And let us show that same love and compassion to others. God, we are a powerful force when we're willing to surrender. Give us a passion to surrender to you and be used. God, we just pray that you would go with us as we leave here and keep us safe. And if you don't return to take us home before we meet again, let us come together one more time and give you the praise, honor, and glory you're so worthy of. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.